Hello, welcome to Discipleship Class 1, Lesson 11, The Holy Spirit. Today is going to be a nice topic. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your greatness, for your mercy, for keeping us strong in times where we don't feel so strong, God. Thank you for your word that says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, God. Lord, as we get ready to study on the topic of the Holy Spirit, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you minister to all those that are watching this. I pray that you reveal the truth of who you are and that it may be a life-changing lesson. Please use me as a vessel and say the things that you want them to hear, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'll meet you back in a few. Go get something to drink. Salud. Today's topic is one that I truly, truly love. The topic of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many of you out there have heard your parents or your grandparents say, I feel the Holy Spirit or, or the Holy Spirit told me X, Y, Z. And when you don't know about the Holy Spirit, you look at them like, <laughs> um, let's talk about the Holy Spirit before Jesus was crucified he promised us the Holy Spirit so let's go ahead and go to the book of John chapter 14 verses 23 to 25 John chapter 14, verses 23 to 25. It says, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. I think I went over to 26, but it's all right. Um, Let's also turn to John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. And this is Jesus talking. This is before his um, before Judas turned him in, before his uh, crucifixion. It says, But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, and remember we just read that just now, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, 
because people do not believe in me about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what, will make, what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So in these two um, passages that we just read, Jesus is talking about us receiving the Holy Spirit. It wasn't with them at the moment. It wasn't until Jesus was crucified that the Holy Spirit came upon us. I know that the Bible was written many, many years ago, but everything that Jesus said is still true till, the, till this day. So the Holy Spirit is still among us. In what we just read right now, let me see if uh, we can go to verse 8. It says, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. And about righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. Anytime you do something or you say something, and you start to feel a conviction, that is the Holy Spirit ministering to you. The Holy Spirit is revealing truth to you. Now, back in the day, whenever the Holy Spirit would do this, I didn't realize that it was a Holy Spirit. And I would try to justify my behavior or my actions or, well, I only did X, Y, Z because that other person did X, Y, Z, so I'm, I'm justified. However, when the Holy Spirit, I know better now because when the Holy Spirit convicts you, when the Holy Spirit is saying something to you, the Holy Spirit is God. And we have read in previous lessons that God is not a man that he shall lie. So whenever the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you, God is the one that's telling you you're wrong. And if you don't listen or try to justify yourself, you're pretty much calling the Holy Spirit a liar. You're, and, and that's blasphemy. Because God is not a man that he shall lie. God is holy. Just now we read about Jesus promising the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to read when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. Let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I'm gonna pause for a second. Wind is, a, it's symbolic for the Holy Spirit, but we'll go into further detail with all the, the symbolic names of the Holy Spirit in a second. Okay, so it says, verse three, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. 
Maybe I should have read up to verse four, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> this topic of the Holy Spirit is such a vast topic. Um, I think that if we wanted to, we could spend a year discussing the Holy Spirit, probably more than that. Um, but this is when the Holy Spirit first came upon the disciples and the evidence of the Holy Spirit being upon them is them speaking in tongues. So I don't know if uh, some of you are familiar with speaking in tongues, but it does happen when people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, it's something that still exists. It still goes on. The Holy Spirit is still among us. The Holy Spirit also allows people to have the courage to speak the good news of the gospel. There are many scriptures that, that speak on the Holy Spirit that talk about no one can say, uh, bless, bless is God, except through the Holy Spirit. Um, but we're going to study the Holy Spirit in a little more detail. The Bible can have many symbolic terms all throughout. And so we're going to go over some of the terms that are used to represent the Holy Spirit. Number one, the dove. Let's go to the book of Genesis, chapter one, verse two. Genesis chapter one, verse two. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters, hovering like a dove. Let's also turn to Genesis chapter eight, verse six. We're going to read verses 6 through 12. It says, After 40 days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven, and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground, but the dove could find nowhere to perch because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. When you study a dove and you wonder like, why, why do they call the Holy Spirit a dove? It's, you know, you have to look at the characteristics of a dove, its peacefulness, its cleanliness. Um, the fact that it becomes easily frightened. Number two, oil. Let's turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. Exodus, chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. It says, Take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it. Consecrate it and all its furnishings, and it will be holy. Then anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils. Consecrate the altar, and it will be most holy. Anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate them. When you, look, when you take a look at the tabernacle, the tabernacle represents Christ and the oil represents the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is anointing Christ. Let's also turn to um, the book of Luke, 
chapter 10, verse 34. Luke chapter 10, verse 34. It says, He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. In the Bible, oil is used a lot in healing. It represents spiritual healing. The Holy Spirit is a spiritual healer. Number three, water. Last week, um, we were studying the deity of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit specifically asked me to um, share this, this parable with you, this story in scripture. And I think I had so much material that... I wasn't obedient, and so now I'm bringing it to you in this lesson. Let's turn to the book of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. This is the story of the Samaritan woman. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water, also known as the Holy Spirit. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. She has no idea what Jesus is talking about. Where can you get this living water? She, she's thinking it's literal. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, 
for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. I am he. So when you read scripture, Jesus never really revealed himself to anyone. Everything was in parables, but this was the first time that he actually said he is the Messiah. Water cleanses. That's how the Holy Spirit cleanses. Number four, wind. Let's turn to John chapter three, verse eight. John chapter three, verse eight. It says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You're, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is invisible. No one knows truly which direction it'll go in. Let's also turn to Acts chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 and I know we just read this but we're going to read it again Acts chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 it says when the day of Pentecost came they were all together in one place suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting the wind is powerful and the Holy Spirit can break the hardest of hearts. Number five, fire. Let's turn to the book of Acts. We're already there, chapter two, verse three. It says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Let's also turn to the book of Revelations, chapter four, verse five. Revelations chapter 4 verse 5 From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. This, the Holy Spirit is symbolized by the seven lamps of fire. Let's talk about the deity of the Holy Spirit. When you first accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you welcome the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. Now we're going to look at some scripture that clarifies this. Let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Well, this verse is telling us that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this verse also exposes the deity of the Holy Spirit because it calls the Holy Spirit God. Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple? Let's turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 22. Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 22. It says, And in him you two are being built together 
to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Again, it's letting you know that when you accept Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. And that is how he communicates with you. He talks to you when you do things you shouldn't be doing. He um, even nudges you whenever um, someone is in need and he wants to use you to minister to that person or to help that person. Or sometimes he'll put it on your in your heart to get something for someone. And it may not really be a big deal to you, but for that person, whatever it is that you're giving them could have a whole nother meaning that you know nothing about, but the Holy Spirit knows, and that's why he asked you to do it. Um, let's talk about the unpardonable sin. So when Jesus came and died on the cross for us, he forgives us of all of our sins. And that includes fornication, um, idolatry, murder, um, I mean, any anything that you've done is pretty much, there's not so, so many things that you can do that you wouldn't be forgiven, but there is one unpardonable sin, and we will take a look at it now. It's in the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 31. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. It says, And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And this came straight from the mouth of Jesus. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. Whenever you're hurting, if the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, he, um, he has a way to minister to you that is very gentle. Um, The Holy Spirit is the one responsible when prophets give you a word. As, as humans, as men, women, there's no way that we could just know details of other people's lives. It's only through the Holy Spirit that certain things can be revealed and therefore prophets are able to tell you some very intimate things that no one knows except God. It is through the Holy Spirit that our eyes can be opened so that we can accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It is through the Holy Spirit that we understand scripture. If you want to understand the Holy Spirit and you want to draw close to the Holy Spirit, my advice is that you fast. Fasting is a good way of drawing closer and more sensitive to the Holy Spirit because you deny your flesh and you feed your spirit. So instead of eating food when you're hungry, you feed your spirit the word of God. And as you read the word more and more and grow in the word, then the Holy Spirit can minister to you through the word. Fasting is an amazing way to, to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. This concludes our lesson for the day. Let's go ahead and close out in prayer. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for ministering to us. Thank you for revealing the word to us. Thank you for being our advocate our comforter, our healer, our guide. Thank you for your word of knowledge, for your word of wisdom. Holy Spirit, 
Please minister to those who are learning about you, God. As they desire to draw closer to you, I ask that you manifest yourself in their life, Lord. Reveal your works to them. Help them to understand who you are. Bless them, Lord. Bless their families. Bless their, the fruit of their labor. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week. I'll see you guys next week. Love you guys.